this is a very good opportunity for the students as we are studying over here but this is a experience which we get and it is a very different horizon which all together gets into something which we want and which we learn in a different and a creative manner when there we have a platform to showcase our talents as well as to learn from others experience after graduating from here mit due to my interest in peacefulness i worked in bamboo architecture and now i have come after long practice to share my experiences with the students of mit and i find that the students are very assimilative in learning new things and also the faculty is very cooperative bamboo architecture although is new to them but they are very keen to learn new subject and in a very enthusiastic manner they are making the products in our workshop bahut achhi opportunity hai ki hamara talent showcase ho raha hai like teachers bahut help kar rahe hain hum logo ko hamare talent ko बढ़ाने के लिए दे आर सपोर्टिंग अस और बहुत अच्छा लग रहा है डू यू थिंक दे आर रियली हेल्पफुल एंड यू आर एंजॉइंग दिस दे आर इंकरेजिंग अस सो मच हम लोगों का जो हिडन टैलेंट है वो निकल के आ रहा है लाइक हम जो हम लोगों ने मतलब ट्राई नहीं किया था हम लोगों को एक्सपोजर मिल रहा है नई नई चीजें ट्राई करने को मिल रही है ना कि टीचर्स आम खूब हेल्प करता है मुझे आम्मी जे कभी ट्राई पर नहीं के लिए अशे असाइनमेंट्स देता है कि जैनी कि यार हाँ अपन अपने इंक्लिनेशन इकड़े पे अपन ये कराला पाजे कि वी शूड मास्टर दिस आर्ट वी शूड ट्राई दिस आर्ट we are very glad to have a nice response from all the students of all the years i hope they will be encouraged and will put in more efforts for the next exhibition to come a very good afternoon to everyone i heartily welcome you all to the third session of this webinar hosted by the department of architecture mit aurangabad to all those who are joining us for the first time i would like to briefly introduce our department to you with a legacy of more than 35 years our department has successfully upgraded and earned a credible name in the field of education we have graduates alumni spread all over the world showcasing their excellence and outstanding performance and making a difference wherever they go currently the department is successfully running three courses b arch m arch urban design and b work interior design course we try to keep all our students abreast with the latest trends and technologies at the same time empowering them to become better professionals as well as human beings mosaic 2020 a techno cultural event which is actually hosted every year by our department this year it goes live online we conduct different activities like expert talks workshops competition cultural events and alumni meet this event is brought live to you as an online extravaganza with educational webinars expert sessions and panel discussions before we start with this session i i request professor vinaya to introduce our speaker for the day thank you ma'am Good afternoon, friends. In today's third session of Omni Interaction, we have with us Mr. Anuj Darbari, Director and CPO, Electro Effectron Luminex Limited, Delhi. After completing Bachelor of Computer Science in 1994, he did MBA with distinction and many online courses in the field of lighting and AV. Mr. Anuj Darbari have designed. and developed the first programmable digital dimming system in the country in the year 1996 and developed the plc based system on cineplexes and multiplexes the systems are being still used for integration with projectors and theater management system with over 25 years of experience in auditoriums studio hotels in pro lighting interiors audio video design project management quality and cost control he has successfully managed a diverse portfolio of projects with various clients in india and abroad having done over 1000 projects few remarkable projects includes rashtrapati bhavan auditorium parliament auditorium high court of punjab haryana and chandigarh international convention center patna aims auditorium numerous doordarshan kendra studios of many news channels iit gandhinagar 
Sharda University, Delhi University, and many more. Some of recognitions are appreciation from President of India, award from the Chief Minister of Punjab for the work at Harpal Tiwana Center of Performing Arts, Patiala, award from Cabinet Minister Mr. Vijay Goel for the most valuable lighting company in the country. It's a great honor to have you here. Welcome home, sir. I request to all the attendee to put their questions in the chat box and the questions will be asked, answered after the session. Now I request Anush Darbari, sir, to proceed with his presentation. Over to you, sir. I request Thank all the panelists to switch off their mics and videos also. Thank you, Professor Vedya and Professor Bhatia. It has been an honor to be back at the college after almost 25 years and never thought while I was studying that I will be delivering a technical session on auditoriums or whatever it could be in, a, in my own alma mater. It's an honor and pleasure for me to be part of our alumni mosaic webinar series. Now, uh, it has been almost 25 years since I have been working in this line and uh, various projects we have done. So I'll quickly like to run through and the various challenges and how the technology and the various mathematical integration comes in. I have specifically chosen uh, auditorium as a subject per se because it's a mini city in itself. When we look at the number of people coming in, the entry, the exits, and uh, the kind of facilities and infrastructure that is being planned. So based on that, out of the various portfolios that we do, so these are the projects uh, that we do. And uh, I've divided my session in one part. I'm covering Sorry, auditorium. Uh, please, full screen. I'll just, I'll just uh, after the slide, I'll go full screen. Now. Yeah. So this is auditoriums uh, per se, and then the new post-COVID norms and uh, what kind of steps are taken. So these will be the two parts of the presentation which I'll be taking care of today. And hopefully it should not be boring. It should be of interest because auditorium is a place where art really meets science. It's a place where it's a conflicts of ideas and performance and fusion of aesthetics that comes into place. It is a space which is being designed for varied performances. For example, it could be a movie theater in the first half a second half could have a dance performance and maybe ending it up with a musical extravaganza being done. Next day, we could have a seminar and deliberation. So it's a, altogether a confluence of all activities and fusing these conflicting requirements. And the, all these uh, requirements creates in a, a specific physical, aesthetical, electrical and digital requirements. For a movie would like to have a surround sound activated. A seminar would like to have a left and right. Uh, music could similarly be a left, right, center performances and things like that. All those things goes in. So fusing these conflicting requirements results in a creation of a complex space. And the, it is being created by the genius of uh, architects and consultants who brainstorm and they come up with a place called auditorium. This is one of the auditoriums, and uh, I had the privilege of being associated with this project. This is supposedly made the was the largest uh, five thousand largest auditorium, which is a five thousand seater auditorium at Patna. Almost uh, this was inaugurated two years back on second of October. So this is one of the projects that we did. Now this is a simple gallery of projects, and each of these auditor when I was talking of conflict of ideas and spaces. Each of these projects are defining a conflicting uh, requirement. The photo on the top, the picture on the top is uh, of the Parliament of India. And this is a multi-purpose auditorium where a meeting could be held, uh, mock parliament sessions are being held, and then cultural programs are being held. Well, when you come down, this is a auditorium at uh, Punjab and Haryana High Court where we don't anticipate any kind of cultural program except Saraswati Vanna being sung or the national anthem being sung. That is the only 
music that can go inside this hall. Rest will be all core discussions and uh, uh, deliberations. So the third one is a horseshoe kind of a thrust stage, which exposes an experimental theater performance. And the fourth one is a seminar come auditorium where there are desks and then people can interact with the speaker. A two-way communication is being felicitated and the lines are quite visible. So these are the four different types of basic auditoriums which we usually come across while designing and developing or executing a project. Now, this is what happens when we are designing a uh, uh, project. In today's time, it is all about the experience. Earlier, it was just about the numbers. Now, today, we are looking at experience. We should take home. When a guest moves out of an auditorium, he should get a feeling of satisfaction. And when he enters an auditorium, he should experience a wow factor. So and the creation of it is a fusion of architect and consultants. So the items marked in red are the areas of architectural designs and the elements marked in black are the elements of consultant scope and amalgamation of all this becomes a project management scope headed by a architectural team so the basic element was shape and size of the auditorium size is directly proportional to the audience that has to be seated. This comes as an input to the architectural firm from the clients per se. And as a thumb rule, depending upon the activity that we are looking at, there are various uh, parameters that are being designed as 0 0.7 to 0.9. Honestly speaking, if I do a designing of it or an I am associated, I usually fight for 10 square feet per person, which is approximately about 0.9 square meters per person because of luxury of the space and comfort level comes in rather than cramped up together. The height varies from six meters to 12 meters for an auditorium. And uh, these heights and uh, height comes into play. How do we decide it by calculating the cubic meter that we are looking at? And these also have a particular standards, the volume of sound that is uh, the area that is required so that the sound can travel and what is the purpose of the sound and what is the purpose so we get the volume and then we get the heights and we extrapolate the whole auditorium shape and size. This is one of the most common slides which everyone come across doing a theater design. And uh, the most common approachable project is a fan shaped auditorium, which out of 10, I mean, six to seven would be a fan shaped auditorium that we do in a year. And uh, then there are a, a box type auditorium, something like a grand salle, which is being depicted over here. And this is one of the pictures. The basic problem doing a rectangular box type uh, auditorium is in terms, not in terms of architectural design, but the problem comes for the acoustical consultant or the acoustical architects uh, who are working on it, because this creates a lot of standing waves in it, which results in creating of flutters and echoes in the whole system. Although there are ways and means because we can't be bounded by just by the shapes and sizes, we need to feel that is why we said it's an art and science. So in this particular case, this is an auditorium in Jaipur, which we, which we did. We find that the ceilings, you could find the contours in the ceilings so that this we are able to absorb, diffuse and reflect out the sounds in various directions. The use of fabric and the uh, absorbers, the diffusers are being created as the pillars, the reflections are there and their pillars are tapered in such a way that the sound is focused towards the center of the hall. Now, this was another challenging project where uh, this was the design layout that we got and uh, the audio system was also frozen up and everything. And uh, this resembled to me like a cathedral or a church with a very high ceiling. And uh, this is in Gujarat and uh, it was subjected to um, uh, Dandia performance also being happening on this stage. So the kind of uh, ba uh, the bass and the music and then the kind of space that was there, this was to be catered to meet that requirement apart from 
meeting a requirement for a space. So we had to do away with the LAN array system, provide them the various speakers in a distributed manner, both above and below the balconies, and then create out a solution to it. Hall with fan shaped, I have already discussed in quite a detail. The basic advantage of using another kind of auditorium is a shoe, horseshoe shaped auditorium. Here, since the entire thing is in a, is in a curvy linear format, so we break these curves into various segments and sections and provide the kind of reflections and diffusers that we want. So accordingly, we build up the whole auditorium into segments and we are able to get a much clearer voice. And the biggest advantage is that the eye contact with the artist or the performer is being maintained. So he's always, always in constant touch, which in a fan shape would have fanned out. And then the person sitting towards the end would never have a contact, which was there in a 5,000 seated auditorium. Now we come down to another interesting and uh, the most technical parameter I call is a sight line. If we don't have a proper sight line, we are not going to have an auditorium in place. We to, it can be anything else but an auditorium. And especially in a multipurpose auditorium, the sight lines again plays a very crucial role because uh, in this case, it could be a dance, it could be a seminar, it could be a theater. And all of these should have an unobstructed view of either the artist or the screen. So, for example, if an artist is dancing and uh, she's wearing a gunguru and then her feet needs to be seen. So the person sitting over here should be able to focus out while at the same time a person sitting, if it's the next show is a movie, you should be able to see the screen without experiencing the cerebral stress on his neck. So when we do this, there are certain theory of physics and there are certain theories of uh, human anatomy that needs that comes into the picture a uh, horizontal cone of eye as has been proven uh, is about anything good to go is between 5 to 30 degrees and if you are looking at recognition of words and characters it is about 5 to 10 degrees of conical uh, view if you are looking at symbols it could be between 5 to 30 and between 30 to 60 degrees is the recognition and decipherness of the colors. So on the frontal side, we are looking at an angle of almost 60 degrees of the eye. And when we move our necks, we create another 90 degrees. So the maximum horizontal cone of vision could be 150 degrees. As I showed was 180 degrees was a viewing angle in the Punjab and Haryana High Court project. So that kind of challenges needs to be thought and worked out. And ideally, the first row is the worst row for an auditorium where the screen viewing is desired. There, the angle usually comes out about 120 degrees, 110 degrees, something like that, depending on the stage opening. Then we are looking at the vertical angles. The vertical angles also have their own limitations. And we are looking at just about 30 degrees of vertical angle as a good uh, thing without experiencing the cerebral stress on the neck. For a three art show, if somebody is putting his neck down or putting his head up, he is going to stress himself and have a spondylitis after a few hours. And then he, the wow and the experience factor goes for a toss. So these are the parameters that one needs to look at. And as a thumb rule, it's about 25 degrees the conical we are presenting is to the center of the scene, see it from the first row. So this is basically our weak angles and the sight line put together creates an experience in itself. Now, what should be the exact distance between the person sitting in the front and the person sitting behind him is being determined by the C value. For example, a person st is uh, standing on a podium a person is standing on a podium and that is about 1.2 meters or 1.5 meters. The person sitting on the right hand side should be able to see him clearly. Whereas the person sitting above, there is a gap of eight inches that risers are eight inches and thereby it is creating a space. Another thing while I was preparing this presentation, 
uh, it's always a learning cycle, I'll rather say. And what I learned while I was doing this, what is being practiced in the European countries is even that they are wearing the treads as well as the width of the seats. When you vary the width of the seats, where it is resulting into this automatic stag staggering of the seats. And when we do a stagger seating, what doesn't look nice with one 17 inches or 19 inches seat width is a staggered eye lines. The eye line should be as straight and as neat as possible. So how they have been achieving is by varying the width of the seats, thereby they are able to maintain a staggering of the seats as well as ensuring we get a proper sight line. There are empirical formulas which are being depicted and uh, for each particular row, we need to find out the C values. And when we do that, we don't get a linear uh, uh, reclining plane, but what we get is a parabolic reclining plane and that parabolic reclining plane is towards comes down towards the middle and has does not have that kind of a steep reclining areas over there so with these formulas being applied for we get a acceptable sight line but uh, if we imagine we are doing a 5000 seater or let's say a normal 2000 seater auditorium which 2000 will be a large scale size auditorium in the, times to come sir so there is a software for uh, um, electroacoustic modeling which is a Mueller BBM software in this Mueller BBM software even what happens is we are placing a camera virtual camera is being placed on the eye line at the eye position of each of this audience and from there both the stage is starting as well as the top of the screen is being measured and plotted at and thereby we are able to analyze for all 5,000 seats what should be the right kind of raking that is required. So these software models gets into play and we are able to say with confirmation and with a sense of relief that the design when it comes out and the audience are seating, there will be no ifs and buts that will come in. Now we do uh, Second part of it is was an architectural acoustical design and acoustical design with respect to an architect's uh, preview becomes the spaces that he or she is considering and that becomes an auditorium. It could be a cinema and classrooms, which I'm just covering in these in uh, today's webinar. And here each of them have some common parameters and some different parameters. For example, an auditorium here we require an acoustical gain to be introduced. Whereas in a cinema, there is a requirement of a surround sound field and not of acoustical gain because that is being done in the sound studios per se itself. And uh, when we come down to classrooms, we are not looking for a very high fidelity of sound system. And uh, in that case, it is more about a speech clarity, noise control and comfort. Noise control, I will be talking later. Then in the room acoustics, uh, we need to take care of absorption, diffusion, and reflection of sound waves. Because the sound propagates through a medium, it needs to be absorbed, it needs to be diffused, it needs to be reflected back in a controlled manner so that we are able to take care of the space in and around it. Now, what is the basic requirement of an auditorium is that uh, we should have an equal sound distribution across every seat. And uh, that can be defined by SPL levels. And we measure that SPL level while designing it. We come out to a theoretical SPL level through a ease plot or ease mapping, which is there. And uh, that gives us various seats, which how much SPL will be there and what will be there and plus minus 3 db is an acceptable parameter across the entire auditorium so almost an equal sound distribution is being heard and this is achieved by reducing sound energy losses then parallelism needs to be avoided we should try to give a direct sound source and audience linkages as far as possible then the volume needs to be optimized and then ideal dimension ratio of length to width is to height. These are ideal ratios and uh, are, we should not take it as a thumb rule because each space is different in each 
auditorium is a different experience center. So we have a ratio also. When the general rule of thumb while doing an acoustic design is uh, the auditorium is being divided into basically three parts. One part is a reflective areas, which is near the stage. The diffusion happens in the middle of the auditorium. And the fag end, we go towards uh, trying to absorb all the sound frequencies. So initially, whatever the speaker uh, the speakers are firing, so those speakers, uh, the reflected sound is being further reflected, reinforced through a reflective plane. And then when we get into the middle, they are being diffused so that no standard or standing waves are being created. And fag end, we are absorbing so that the reflections and the delayed sounds are not happening. The next diagram is a time delay in milliseconds. Because of the reflections, what happens is there will be one direct sound which has been denoted by D, and there will be a reflected sound which will come after hitting the wall or the ceiling. So we have to plan out our reflectors, our reflecting surfaces in such a way that R1 plus R2 minus D divided by 0.34 should be less than 3 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds. Micro milliseconds. So in this case, what happens is we are literally working in a very, very comfort, uh, comfort zone and no echoes are experienced if we are able to achieve this. And all these are through modelings and empirical formulas. When I was talking about a reflection and a diffusion, these are the three examples which we are looking at towards the end of the auditorium and uh, a sound wave comes up it hits back is hitting on the back wall and then it is the back wall is acting as a diffusers so it is being diffused so we are not getting a very loud area or a totally dead area in the audience spectrum then another way of managing the sound is by tilting the rear wall here we get it and the sound is being focused once again to the audience sitting there. And if we can't do that, either of the two is not possible, then what we need to do is create an acoustical envelope in this area. Acoustic envelope becomes a very dense sound absorption materials are being put up. Maybe a, a wood wool board with a, a glass wool or a synthetic fiber followed with a carpet or something like that, that needs to be planned so that all the sound energy is absorbed. And if you don't do that, we are inviting troubles. And then it becomes a blame game in auditorium that this is not my fault. And this is not this uh, architect's fault. And this is somebody else's fault. The client suffers. What happens if this is not an acoustical envelope? The sound wave comes over here, hits back, and then also hits back over, back to the audience. So we are creating another path of traversity while the direct sound is coming from here, which reaches here. So there will be a delay because R1 plus R2 minus D divided by 0.34 is going to be something like uh, 0.8 second or 0.9 second. And whereas the desired is about 0.3 milliseconds. So this will create a lot of eco and this area becomes a noisy area. Now, for ages, Sabine's formula is one of the sure shot uh, formula for providing an acoustic. These are all hypothetical values that I have taken up, broken the auditorium into various uh, the walls, into various uh, areas of diffusions, reflections, and absorptions. And also, we have a list of material for having different kind of absorption coefficient. These are just a few of them. Even a vacant seat also has an absorption co coefficient. People on opposite seat has 0 0.40 kind of absorption coefficient. 0 0.9 and 0 0.95 are the best absorption coefficients available for some of the ceiling tiles. So let's say, consider our example, we're looking at a rear interior wall. The area which happens is about 45.3, uh, 45 square meters, let's say, that comes out in a hypothetical situation. And 45.3, and we are looking at an acoustical uh, envelope. So we see the NRC values. 
we find that either we can use, use a wood fiber board and, or an acoustical blanket to absorb all the sight. So we multiply this with this and we put out in the Sabine's formula. Similarly, stage front wall, the stage floor needs to be reflective. We are looking at 0 0.10 kind of hardwood being used. So we get a reflective area in that. So all these things are being formulated. RT60 is being calculated as 0.161 as a constant multiplied by the volume. The volume is hypothetical is 760 cubic meters and then divide by the summation. Then we do the summation of all the areas multiplied by the absorption factor. We get a value of RT60. Anything between 1 to 1.5 is a good uh, number to reckon with for uh, RT60 value. Now we are looking at a noise control uh, segment. Uh, noise control, we have done the acoustics, we have done the aesthetics, we have planned our system. But what we have forgotten is where to place the HU. And finally, we uh, find that the HU units are being placed near the stage and uh, adjoining the green rooms or somewhere there. So what happens is on the stage, we have the most sensitive microphones possible suiting a particular client budget and these are capable of picking up uh, the smallest frequency differences so wh whenever the hu the compressor turns on the compressor switches off the blower comes up the noise is being transmitted through the ducts and those noises are being picked up by the microphones and that creates an additional noise to be countered with so we need to plan out our air conditioning system in such a way that that noise is being eliminated from entering the hall. That is, we should have good anti-vibration molds and at a specific distance away from the main area. We can allow the main duct to enter from the rear of the stage rather than entering from the uh, front of the stage or near the stage area. Then ambient noise isolation, we need to separate, maybe grow more greeneries outside and uh, provide a sound locks for the entrance doors, uh, seal all the leakage spots in. And uh, that is how we can manage the ambient noise isolations. Then vibration transmission is another uh, issue which is required to be handled in an auditorium. And here the Auditorium, we can do an enveloping of an auditorium through sand uh, filled uh, pit and then the concrete on the other side of the road and concrete on the on this side, the two plates get separated and there is the vibration separation that happens. And thereby it's auditorium is a standalone entity altogether with respect to conduction. Now, here uh, gets a uh, consultant into the domain and uh, how do we define a sound? A sound is a vibration that propagates as an acoustical wave through a transmission medium. The denser the transmission medium, the longer will be the wavelength and thereby it can travel to a larger distance. Now, inverse square law is a thumb rule for designing any audio system in an auditorium. Uh, as we increase the distance, we are increasing it inversely to the square of the distance. So if this was x, if we do it 2x, what happens is we are increasing the envelope by four times and thereby a dB reduction of minus six dB levels. So accordingly, we need to work on our speaker systems, our amplification system, so that these losses that are happening we have those segments in place so that uniform, uh, uniform sound travels throughout the auditorium. Our human ears are capable of hearing a sound range from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. This is a theoretical statement that comes. And honestly speaking, we all hear fading of the sounds. Uh, we are not able to hear a, a good quality of sound beyond 4000K, between 4K frequencies. So this is what we are looking at. Whenever we are doing a conversation or something, it is about uh, 300 hertz to 3 kilohertz. 
a guitar plays between 80 hertz to 12k hertz and so and so forth we have various instruments being played and amalgamation and then the question comes in if our ear only appreciates the frequency of 4k then what is the need of playing an instrument which generates 10k is the amalgamation of frequency that creates a envelope of sound which we are able to appreciate and enjoy the clarity of the sound of, of a conversation or the levels at which I'm talking or you may be hearing is of about 65 dB and is almost about 2K or 2.2K. That is what is happening. Now, the SPL is the sound pressure level, which is a direct function of an amplitude of a sound wave. Usually, to understand what is the dB propor proportions, we say that 60 dB or 80 dB or 100 dB sound level should be there in an auditorium. A zero dB SPL is ideal for a TV studio. It's a dead space. It's a recording studio where everything that is being reproduced should be heard. A 20 dB SPL could be the hustling of the uh, tree leaves or high speed wind blowing around with the trees and the things moving around. A 60 dB SPL is what we talk and communicate and a conversation is happening. 80 dB when we move out to a railway station, a bus stand or an alarm wakes up us from about 15 dB SPL, 20 dB SPL at night or early in the morning wakes up. That is at 80 dB SPL, the alarm sound that comes in. And the ideal range that we should try to kill the sound level is about 140 dB, but our ears are sensitive and they can absorb up to 194 dB SPL. A 194 dB is a huge sound. It could be something like an explosion in an oil refinery or a jet uh, fighter plane taking off from a runway where you're standing without your uh, headphones on. And these may damage your ears. So we need to take care as designers and think of the social factors also around what kind of sounds we are looking at. Usually, our auditorium is designed with a high SPL level of about 110, 115, 120 dB SPLs. The spec sheets may show a higher SPL for the speakers, but 120 dB is a very, very good SPL level for a particular auditorium. Then uh, frequencies are being broken into three bands, the low frequencies, the mid frequencies, and the high frequencies. I wish I could have played the sound, but uh, we could have explained what are the what do we hear when we are talking of high frequencies but nonetheless a high frequency range is in the range of about 10k when a violin is playing or a, a drum set is being playing certain chimes are being created so that happens a low frequency would be a tabla bass or dholak bass or Amitabh Bachchan's voice carries a lot of bass. He has a lot of low, low frequency built into his voice. And, and each voice spectrum is also broken up into various segments. Uh, mid frequencies also gets into play. And overall, in level of creates the total sound experience. Now, getting down to the audio signal chain, there are a few components. One is the source. The other one is a good quality of cable and uh, connector should be used because the client ends up paying a humongous amount of money for processors, amplifiers, microphones, loudspeakers, and the contractor tries to cut his corners by providing not a good quality of cable or uh, getting down to a second graded connectors. And the entire, whereas the connectivity lies the heart lies on the cable and the connectors itself because that is the only thing where the system integrator does understanding the system and then focusing it so i'll not be touching more on the sources and the cables what i would like to talk on is the processor amplifier and the loudspeakers in the coming say whatever we hear for example right now it's an unmodulated sound but the moment you get on to a tv show or you hear a, a musical program the real sound is the real voice is different. The modulated voice is a world of a difference. There is a world of a difference. Various factors, the frequencies are enhanced, the frequencies are reduced, the gates are applied, the gains are settled. So the real sound, the real voice is missing, and it's a modulated and a reinforced voice that gets into the picture. 
the compressors and the limiters are required to ensure that the human ears does not hear much of the uh, higher sound than what is desired, as well as also secure our amplifiers from getting a higher inputs. Then AEC is what is required in most of the auditoriums now with the advent of uh, video conferencing. We have to kill down the latencies. For example, initially, Pro Professor Bhatia said that please switch off your microphones. Uh, that was just to ensure that we don't get an echo back. And uh, since it's a live thing without any modulations, there is nothing like a processor which is being placed or planned in between. So echo cancellation cannot happen. So the best way is do it manually. So that is how it was working. It is working. Then delays are required so that one sound is only heard and that ensures that echoes are not generated. So this is the heart and the most uh, uh, loved part of a uh, audio supply chain that I call it is the digital signal processor. Here we can play with it and make anyone sound good or anyone sound bad. Now these are uh, different speaker layouts and uh, a speaker layout could be a distributed ceiling speakers which uh, the image one shows are good enough for a lecture theater where uniform distribution is happening, the hearing Lines are drawn at 1.2, so the hearing plane is there, not much of the amplification required. Then we're looking at the second and the third image together. The third image focuses on a very narrow beam of the speaker elements, of the array elements that comes into picture. So each of these elements are focusing on a couple of rows and thereby covering the entire auditorium. But then the question comes, we. Uh, couple of slides back, I said, is inversely proportion to the distance, the SPLs will be decaying. So what happens is we look at this, this will explain us in a better way. These are various elements and each element has a different uh, wattage of the speaker, different fidelity in it, different harmonic distortions and different amplification. For example, this will have a lower amplification required, whereas this will have a larger throw from the speaker and a higher amplification. So the real sound goes there. So these are, these are tricky things, but uh, there are softwares and there are algorithms which uh, are being worked upon. And uh, there is after this comes an ease mapping and ease plot, which gives the kind of sound levels across each and every seats. Then this is a distributed uh, sound system. We see this is what we did at uh, the church type of auditorium a shoebox style where we had the main FOH and then we had the distributed and each of these speakers were pointed and focused with the desired beam angle to cover the different seating areas, thereby reducing on the echoes. So this takes care of our auditorium, the lightings uh, are the areas of lights. I'll just try to run down because the purpose of a light is to highlight the face of the artist and the dancers, as well as uh, provide the necessary glows and gleam on the dresses. And uh, this is how we go about it. A different performance has a different requirement. And a different requirement in this case comes down from a basic white light from the FOH front of the house to a various lasmatized color lights coming down from the wings and the backlight. This is for a dance performance. The next performance is a theater where we are just highlighting the areas of the artist sitting and the artist moving, and there is no razzmatazz around. So it is a different light setup. And all these things happens through a program system. A typical system would be, we have the bars on the stage, we have the ladders, we have the equipments, the push or the light ladders of the halls and the F front of the house, the control gets packed into the control room. The lighting angles and positions play an important role in the overall gambit of things. It should provide a comfort to the speaker. It should provide a non-glare illumination and should provide the basic shadow-free lighting. That is the purpose of a lighting. If these things are being met, we'll have a definitely a very happy artist and a good video being recorded. As I explained earlier, the front of the house lights are housed in the audience area. They are usually recessed inside a false ceiling and where the false ceiling height or the air conditioning or other services do not permit us 
to integrate and operate the lights. In that case, we provide the trusses, which moves the light bar up and down and thereby providing an access to the lights. As explained, all these lights, even if you see in the live shows, this is a theoretical thing and the, this is a practical. They are all are coming at an inclined angle. None of the light is a straight light, which is forming. So this is how we go about it. They're complementing each other. Then the side parts is one thing which I request young architects to please allow this particular element to be introduced. We find it really hard to brainstorm and convince the architect. I know it affects the aesthetics, but we have to integrate the aesthetics in such a way that these lights are hidden or if we are not able to hide them, they are essentially required. Please do not disallow this light to be put up in auditorium. Now, we have uh, overhead side lights. This separates an artist. If the artist is standing over here, we are separating him from the background by doing a cross lighting, which comes from the stage. And then he feels a uh, totally, for example, we could have a river flowing on the background in the, on the cyclorama screen and the artist is sitting on a saleable boat. So we are just highlighting the boat and the artist while the projection is showing the sea. So he's being separated rather than being flooded into the sea or a river in which he was sailing his boats. Now this comes down to a downlight and here the downlights provides uh, more use of dramatic colors, helps them provide a sense of illumination and takes away the dark spots or the blank areas of the lighting, as well as they at times require to focus on certain parameters which are towards the back end of the stage. The cyclorama light can provide us a hue of colors with LED getting into place. We are looking at almost 16 million colors and every day they are expanding exponentially. Now we have a moving headlight. So the moving lights and the intelligent light, which is the present day thing. The old school of artists would like to go back to the conventional lights. The new school of artists prefer a moving light, which is more controllable and uh, color temperatures are, can be easily matched. This is uh, another example of how we are trying to create a redundant system. The auditorium is full to capacity. There has been a problem and the main signal cable, the blue line to the control room fails. So what happens? Either the program goes off for a toss or there will be a huge commotion. We need to take breaks or something. So what we do is we always wire it with two connectors and try to provide a standby system as a backup console. So whatever is being done in the main console is being recorded as a queue in the back, uh, backup console. So never ever we'll have a session which is closing because of technical issue. A present the theater console takes care of uh, various color management. We can pick up a palette. These are the buttons. These are the faders. We can select a light, light number two on bar number three. Suppose this particular red spot is there. And then we come down to the color palette, what color we want and where we want to position it out. And it goes and does its function. I'll try to run out a training video of uh, Philips lighting and uh, this should show this is before the show we are we were programming it out now these are all simulations which are happening these are the light beams which are moving corbanega karolpati type you can visualize and then see how they move now he is turning on the fan function and here we go So like this, there are many things that can be programmed. We can provide colors to it. Now this is panning, tilting, all these things are happening and all everything is being computer simulated, recorded onto this console 
transferred to your iPad and your iPad can control the show. That is where the technology has taken us. And in the COVID times, post COVID times, iPad controls are going to be the end thing. Earlier, it was audio and video, which has taken the iPad controls to a very large extent. Uh, I have no affinity towards iPad, uh, so it's uh, any tablet that can be used. So there are softwares which are available for uh, Android as well as Mac versions of uh, tablets. They can be, either of them could be used. So we can do all these things using uh, our own tablet and the show is controlled through this. I'm just running you through, because of the paucity of time, I'm just running through the stage lighting. And I ended up with the right guidelines, a facility lighting system could provide everything that it needs for years to come and fulfill a happy group of end users. That is the main aim of architects. That is the main aim of a consultant. And that is the goal of any performing artist. Then we have the stage furnishing system, which comes up. A stage furnishing system could be divided into various elements. I could go on and on, but uh, the time, I guess I would be running out of time. So can share these slides and you can have it from the department also. So you could please explain some of these. No problem. We are. We okay. Have thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So when we are looking at a curtain system, uh, there can be there are usually three curtains uh, that get into the auditorium. One is the main curtain, which could be a center parting or vertical lift, uh, vertical lifting curtains. Then we have an act curtain. If the depth is large, we need to provide an act curtain so that a stage can be divided into two parts, and the infinite background is not being created. Suppose it's a tw uh, twenty meters stage wide and almost eight meters depth, and a single person is giving a speech probably he gets lost in infinity. So to prevent that, the act curtain comes up and the depth of the stage is reduced to six meters. We dry, used to mask him by reducing the stage size, keeping the line of sight in mind so that the last seat can, the first row's last seat can also have a view of the speaker. So accordingly, the placements are being done and the curtain system plays an important role to that. The light bars, as explained earlier, comes in the front of the house on as well as on the stage. Each of the light bars are being masked so that the lights are not visible to the audience, barring the first two, three rows because of the steep angle that they make to the ceiling. So the first two, three rows do make an impact over there. So the lights are being masked and the frill bar helps in masking those lights. And wing separates the audience from the backstage artists. So this provides a barrier and these are pivoted or they are sliding wings uh, depending on the design that we are looking at. So wings is another important element of the whole system. Cyclorama we have already seen can create an infinite background. We can have a, a, a slide, couple of slides down the line. I'll, we'll have it, uh, a Kavali being done with a sunset being created artificially on the cyclorama. And uh, the side ladders, in fact, we had seen how we are separating the artists from the backdrops. Now, the curtain system, if you look at it, uh, I'm talking purely in terms of uh, quality perspective. What happens is mostly they are being fabricated in India uh, at site and at the mercy of the skill set of welders. So ideally, as is being done in Western and the European countries, they are being prefabricated and pre-modeled. So only thing that you do at site is assemble them. They are being prefabricated. They are being treated, zinc passivated, so that they can stand the withiness of weather, the roughness of times, and they can go without any rusting or any damage. Because the weight of the curtain is also huge. Once they are parked, they could weigh as good as 500 kgs over one meter being collected on one side of the stage. So we should, the rail should be that heavy that it can take the load of it. Then these are photographs of our installations where the various light bars are there. They are motorized and they come up and down. They can be, the lights can be cleaned. 
the bars, any fault or troubleshooting can be done up. And in a typical theater today, we are experiencing about putting on almost 20 light bars. And each of the bars are being suspended through steel wire ropes, through the pulley system mechanism, and a cable retracting system. This video, I'll just play it for a very short duration of time, where the bar is coming down through an electrical panel control system. The cables are being coming down through a cable retractor. So we don't have any cable is spilling right or left. They are all retract inside a channel retracting. And they come to a junction box where from where they are distributed on the cable duct. So we have a neat system. And the lights are being integrated. Each of the lights should have a connector rather than using a insulation tape mechanism from the light to the bars. And that is how a system should work. Now, we have wings I've already talked about, the cyclorama screen. This is what the screen I was talking about. These uh, these were the props, and we tried to create a sun sunset with a, a sun being created by light and then color mixing the various hues on this white screen. Earlier, this was blue, where it was used as a projection screen with a uh, digital signature of a projector from Christie, which is being which was used. So that. So the cyclorama is the last element on the stage. It provides, it can act as a screen as well as it acts as a background border. Now we look at, uh, with this, we are done with the stage lighting, the audio. We're looking at a video with a multimedia presentation system. Once again, the screen size is of a critical importance. The last person should be able to see it. There are institutes, American national standards are available. There are theater institutes, ENC, ENSI, which gives us a standard. Then there is an Infocom society, which gives us a screen sizing standards, two, four, eight. And accordingly, with the passage of time, they also interpolate with other activities for character recognition, for image recognition, and things like that. And overall, a screen is being designed today with a lot of empirical formulas which goes in into it. Then projector, the video walls, the active LED, this area is mind-boggling and is changing every month, if not week, the kind of technology that is being infused every now and then. You keep on learning. Now we have got down to a LED with a video, uh, LED for video wall with a pitch of 1.5 mm. That means we can put it, put a video wall of a huge size, even in an entrance lobby, to get a kind of experience that we usually get out uh, in Disney World or uh, Hollywood kind of thing, or a Dubai museum where the 4K plays a major role. So these are the things which are going to come into picture. Then touch-free controls uh, and AV over IP has already taken, has already happened. Audio video is no more a thing of a standalone percolates down to the office uh, IP address and IT guys take care of resource allocation and the bandwidth. So we need to have a very good relationship with the IT guys so that uh, we don't get any kind of AV bandwidth issues that comes into picture. Another thing which is coming into the video uh, and multimedia presentation is uh, the use of artificial intelligence and uh, that helps us in creating our augmented reality and uh, virtual re reality scenario. I'm doing a museum these days where there, there is no artifact placed in the museum. There is a holography screen, which is there. There are almost two dozen uh, augmented reality QR codes, which are being marked in the place. So one moves with his QR, uh, with his own device, he scans the QR code, you, the, audio streams, the video streams on his uh, mobile set, and the audio streams onto his headphones. And that is how that is where the future is going to be. This was a pre-COVID design, yet to be implemented because of the lockdown. But that is how we are going ahead. So the museums will face a different scenario rather than artifacts. It will all become a virtual museum using augmented and virtual reality. 
This was a video system at ICC Patna. The main screen was used as a cyclorama screen because this screen size was not possible for uh, any screen manufacturer to build that kind of a projection screen. This is screen is about 18 meters wide that we were looking at and being fired through a 20,000 lumens projector. There were LCD walls on the left and the right side of the hall. So the person sitting in the balcony or the roar balcony can also see what is being delivered and happening on the stage. So the distance and direct contact is being taken care. Here, the FOI light bar was here. And this was a because of the ceiling height that we, are, we were looking at, uh, it was an exposed catwalk that was created, painted black, so that it can merge with the ceiling and the lights could be focused. When I had put my foot down in this particular project, that my technician, whenever, whosoever operates it, because we'll install it and then we'll go out. But the people who are going to operate it should find it safe to work at this height without falling from this height. So there has to be a proper catwalk. There have to be a place where the safety harness could be clipped on. And then at a comfort level, they can focus and set the lights. So this is an exposed uh, and uh, exposed catwalk lighting system. Another video example was uh, a judicial academy at Chandigarh, where the main projector was 7,000 lumens. This was done in 2009. So 7,000 lumens at that time was a good uh, lumens output that we were looking at. The entire screen could be covered. Then there were supportive displays, a 65 inch LCD display on the left and right for the people towards the end could see. Now, this was a Punjab and Haryana High Court. This was either a 98 inch plasma panel or 103 inch plasma panel that I'm not quite sure, but it was probably 103. That was the largest panel that was available. Why we chose to use this was because the judges were sitting, the honorable judges could not uh, tolerate a projector light that could hit or that could be hitting the face or eyes, which will, is, a course of, is a source of distraction and uncomfortness, while the person sitting over here should also be able to watch the presentation. The basic challenge, and this was the first auditorium of this shape that I did, was the, and I was not convinced, even as of now, I'm not convinced, developing an auditorium of this size because the person sitting over here is hardly able to see what is happening towards this place so the only way i could make him see was we installed a couple of cameras over here took the feed to the control room and through the control room we projected it onto the display the beauty of this plasma display at that time was this could create a 180 degrees 178 degrees to be precise enough kind of a viewing angle so this became almost a flat wing without any glare and without any loss of intensity. So the person who was sitting over here could see it. But in auditorium, we usually go to watch a live performance or to hear the speaker say maintaining an eye contact rather than the only good part was the eye contact was maintained. But in only one half, either he, this half was able to maintain eye, an eye contact or this half was if the speaker was on the other side. So. These are a few of the challenges. And for the judges uh, who were sitting here, the honorable judges could watch the proceedings which are happening on the displays on left and right. This is a President State Cultural Center. And uh, none of the speakers, considering the space, neither the projector was visible, neither the speakers are visible. The proscenium in itself has been designed in such a way that uh, the speakers were placed behind these raw silk fabric that was being used in the curves over here. Even the President State Auditorium, I must express my gratitude to the architect who agreed to provide me a ladder in the hall. Although it does disturb, but it has never created a program where any dark shadow has ever been observed. This is Sadar, Bhave, uh, Sadar Patel Bhavan Patna Disaster Management Center a conference room, which is these days used as a COVID center, as well as a flood relief management center presently being used. This is a State Bank of Patiala headquarters conference room, where 
we were looking at almost 30 people on either side. That was a huge size. So a screen, we could not go for a larger screen or a larger wall, considering the ceiling height was a limitation. So with this ceiling height limitation, we tried to use multiple LCD displays. This was all glass on this side, which is an acoustical disaster. But uh, managing with the ceilings and uh, the reflections over here, we used the glasses as the reflectors on this side. The absorbers were on this side of the wall where we got a brick wall. There are a few good practices one should follow always. And uh, color coding of the conduits, for ruling the circuits on either side, use joint-free cables. We should emphasize the need of using a joint-free cables because uh, we do a system once and it has to run for years together. And uh, installers are never going to be there to run the system. Maybe three years contract would be there as part of the initial tender. But after three years, the auditorium stands for another 25 years. So all these practices should be there, label the device and define the area which it is covering and things like that. They need to be documented as well as physically marked and care. When I was talking in color coding the conduit, this is one of the installations where we see a red color being conduit being laid separately. This is for fire and smoke uh, detectors. Then we have the green set of conduits, which is going for the low voltage signals. A blue one is for the audio signals. The yellow on top is going for our video signals. The white color is for our power and electrical circuit. So all cables, whenever is, this is documented and has been handed over to the clients, so whenever they need to look into a video signal connectivity or video problem, they just need to look out at the yellow conduit, which is coming out in the junction box on either side and try to trace out whether the fault is there, rather than was looking out at a lot of conduits. Now, the new norm, this is the last segment of my session, which is the new norm COVID-19 and beyond. And here it is, artificial intelligence is the way I hate. BYOD is bring your own device. BYOM is bring your own meetings. These are the buzzwords, which are BYOD was the buzzword, which was pre-COVID. BYOM is the buzzword, which is work from home. Bring your own meeting at your place. A touch-free system, a gesture-enabled systems, facial recognition with and without mask. Here, the AI gets into the picture. The database gets looks into it. The database covers the face with a mask pattern and thereby able to recognize it. The QR code the virtual reception, the digital signage, the virus-free environment. Uh, when I talk of virus-free environment, we are looking at, uh, till now, usually the specifications have been to use uh, antifungal material, fire retardant fabric material, fire retardant material. Now the new material will come in, will be antiviral material. This is a patented, patented technology from a Switzerland-based company, which they have researched during the COVID periods and have come up with uh, antiviral chemical. So, and a lot of companies, even in India, have already have had a forward agreement and arrangement to manufacture them. Even for our shirts, I was quite surprised to read, go through that article. Even for that shirt, the Reliance has entered into an agreement for their Wimmel fabrics and things like that, Erwin Mills all these companies have already entered into a viral free fabric which will be very shortly available so these things will form a new part now social distancing is again a new norm this is an auditorium at Ames Patna here we see that uh, pre-COVID-19 we had a lot of people we had extra chairs being put up in the front area sofas being put up and people were there the uh, in the cent in the dais we had all the dioceses close together each other people sitting next to each other during the pandemic they wanted to award this doctors and the nurses who had worked so this is what has changed the dioceses have disintegrated the peoples have separated and this is how they are seated the seating pattern even for the audience we find two to three people seated per row and alternate rows are getting free. It would have been better if 
couple of them would have been a handicap friendly rows where wheelchair could have moved in a handicap friendly design is a norm probably the building national building code also prescribes it but unfortunately it gets overlooked in a larger gambit of providing larger number of chairs because two ch normal chairs is equal to one handicap chair and a ramp it eats up almost two rows for a handicapped person to get onto the stage so there are certain winch lifts that come in which takes as much space as uh, a staircase and uh, a motorized lift comes up which was used at rashpati bhavan unfortunately i have it never struck me to include that over here and i never thought i would be talking on challenges uh, for a physically challenged person to be incorporated but it happened and that should all needs to be planned and thought for while we are designing a system this is a digital way of life a new norm post covid a audience check in audience book a ticket at home he gets a certain ticketing message audience checks in get a thermal imaging and a facial recognition integrated kiosk because with uh, his face being there everything gets through once he's through with this gate he gets on to a virtual reception where the guidance is there and a pre alert goes in to the audi that so many guests are coming in he just has to check in so there are two entry checkpoints that have been created in case to handle a larger thrust of people once he enters into the area premises virtual reception also gives him or her the clear picture he gets down to a digital lobby where finding signages so those signages which had a poster of a theater artist or a filmmaker or celebrity is being replaced with a signage interlaced with those artists which is going to come on and off again so that the signages could be and these signages minded will all be gesture driven so you move your hand like you touch your screen through your your fingers on the ipad you don't have to touch it it will be the cameras which will guide you you are standing there is a camera in front of the panel and that will take your picture and uh, you know that the gesture is now being enabled you are waiting here and trying to see something so the gesture algorithm gets activated and your sliding or up and scrolling movements start happening so this is the way forward so once he gets to know he has to go to audi 3 or audi 4 or room ab he comes down and checks it in today it is done through mm, the demo uh, things or the existing devices are through finger touch these are going to be replaced through byod that will bring your own device through your own algorithm that checks in you click over here the bluetooth over there in the panel gets enabled you get a green signal please move in the hall is ready for you this is the way i had and this is the digital way of life in a new norm so with this i tried to cover most of the things and uh, i would like to name few of the consultants and czars who have guided me and taught me number one was my father himself he is a uh, mtech electronics my uncle is phd in acoustics then uh, this was in house and i have learned a lot over not only after my formal education but during my primary education also and then the consultants uh, who have helped me understand my subject and the field are late uma shankar bhargav ji then gautam suri sir vijay purandre sir kel malhotra sir then professor shyamal kumar das mandal sir and uh, professor satsangi who my hold in the upmost stream then architect pankaj malik and architect sukumar kumar jayarat apart from others who have always helped me and guided me through their own design concepts last but not the least the team of engineers all these projects would not have been possible had my team of engineers and technicians not meticulously transformed my drawings or the designs on the brainstorming tables into reality overall it's a summation and an amalgamation of theoretical knowledge a practical implementation and a never say die attitude of the team members who are there at the project site you all can reach me at, at the number mentioned either through mobile zoom call or on my 
email ID is all being there. And this presentation, I can share it through a Dropbox, and you can have it from the college if required. Thank you once again, everyone. Thank you very much, sir. It was an amazing session. We are truly delighted to have you. And I'm sure the students have benefited a lot, even the faculty. We are getting lots of messages on the YouTube that uh, the session is amazing and very descriptive and very clear. And the concepts have been cleared properly. We also have with us uh, our Dean, Dean Alamia Force, Professor Vinay Chidri. I request him to please uh, say a few words and interact with uh, Engineer Anush Darbari. Uh, thank you, madam. Uh, hi, Anuj Darbari, sir. Thank I, you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> you can you. switch on your video. Okay. We'd like to see you. Okay. <laughs> I hope I'm audible. Uh, I'm visible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So it was a great session. Rather, I attended it right from uh, uh, zero. And I never had uh, thought of the things which uh, take place into auditorium and acoustics and all. I have just heard it from my uh, few of my friends of uh, who are architects and all. But never thought that this much of technology is being uh, used in uh, seminar halls and conference rooms and uh, uh, cinema halls. I never thought of this. And I think uh, it was an amazing session, really amazing session. It's not just a word I'm using. Because a person who had never known about, uh, never knew uh, what is architecture and what is acoustics and what is uh, designs of this uh, seminar halls and all, you kept me uh, completely interested throughout the year session. And uh, really, I thank, rather, uh, I don't know where to, whether to say sir, it. Sir, please, not. don't be that <laughs> modest, sir. <laughs> you have always been modest throughout the careers. Actually, actually, uh, this pandemic, we were thinking that uh, we are losing something, but this has a, uh, become as a, uh, has given us an opportunity to interact with the people whom calling at MIT campus would have been uh, of great difficulty. Our students are quite lucky. I uh, really thank uh, the department and uh, you that you have given a great opportunity. You have shared your variety of experience with uh, at a uh, very high level of experience and you have shared it with the students of this era. I would request all the students to take maximum benefit of this uh, video conferencing sessions by alumni and because uh, to teach the students in the classroom and they were knowing uh, if somebody is not understanding, we could understand the, uh, who is listening and who is not uh, understanding. But now that is very difficult. So now the student uh, community has to take equal responsibility of making it understand themselves and uh, making it more and more interactive. So uh, I thank you from my bottom of heart that with one, only one uh, request, you have accepted this invitation. And I also thank the Department of Architecture and the uh, head of the department, uh, Mrs. Bhatia, that she has allowed, uh, uh, my, uh, she has uh, arranged this with very uh, less time. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you very much. I enjoyed the session like anything. Thank you thank so you, much. Sir. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. It has been my most humbling session and an experience to get back to my alma mater and uh, share my own experiences. Although I may be at times during the presentation a bit. Uh, not so good towards the architects, uh, the challenges that we faced, but I wanted them to understand that these are the requirements and therefore I emphasize on that angle also. I, 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 would, request, for that. <laughs> I would request Bhatia, madam, if time permits, uh, can we have some experiences of uh, Mr. Anuj Darbari uh, during his MIT times? One or two experiences which you can share. Yes, sir, definitely. Definitely we can have it. I wasn't prepared for that, but it has been a <laughs> journey. <laughs> well, uh, I graduated, uh, joined MIT in 1990, and that was a time of the primitive uh, formation where uh, our Honorable Kavle sir also used to have a one-to-one -one interaction 
Lomte Madam used to have an interaction and uh, we used to interact with each other. They, he would remember each and every student by his name, which was yeah. one thing which was very amazing. And even now, even today, whenever we get come to college just to pay our visit or something like that, he remembers us by our first name, which is an amazing thing for a director to remember all those students who have graduated through ages. Correct, correct. Very that correct. was one uh, thing. The second thing was uh, MIT taught me to be positive, always have a positive lookout to life and situations although they may be extremely challenging there is a silver lining at the end of the tunnel so that silver lining at the end of the tunnel has been taught uh, from mit so i take these two major factors technology yes we learned some technology in college we learned something on our own and then we amalgamated but there is a light at the end of the tunnel is something which college taught never to forget that so all challenges we accept and we never say no to anything. We try to develop a solution based on existing technology and requirement and deliver it out. So this is the experience that I bring from MIT to my professional life. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, can we go for some questions, please? I request Professor Dipali uh, to ask the questions from the Thank you, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, Chidri, sir. Uh, uh, this is really um, what Chidri, sir, said. The, the person who is having very less knowledge, that person must have learned a lot from your explanation, whatever the things you have shared through your detailed uh, presentation. Sir, it was indeed a very wonderful session explaining very well about the different considerations for auditorium designs about the acoustics and the illumination part of the auditorium. You explained each and every aspect very nicely. We have some questions in uh, our YouTube. Uh, I would like to go to the questions. And the first question is there, as you uh, explained about that there are some problems which you face. So we got to know that what is your approach do you have when you need to tackle integration of architectural design and technical solutions? Uh, the approach is very simple. It's a single line approach. We have to try to convince an architect that this is required and make ourselves convinced also. It's a two-way traffic that whatever the architect has designed, it's basically the thought process is the heart of the building. So A, we should not alter the design that the architect has given as far as possible. Try to assimilate whatever is there. And if not possible, that is the last resort where we have to put our foot down that we need it. For example, it was Rashpati Bhavan Auditorium. The light ladder architect was not agreeing to it initially. But I said, sir, we'll have the highest office in the country. We'll have the best of the persons visiting the country. So we need to highlight them. Would you like to have a stance being put up in the auditorium in the middle of the seat so that the light falls on the face properly? You would not like to. When this question was put to them, then they agreed to it that on either side we'll have it. So that was the only design that we altered. Rest we tried to integrate the ceiling. The uh, FOS lights were all in the false ceiling as everything went up. So the first thing is try to maintain the heart of the auditorium and we provide the beats which is basically the designs then the technology infusions that is simple approach thank you sir uh, sir there is one more question what is an appropriate reverberation and why rt60 is an appropriate reverberation time that is the sound wave should decay in one second the moment we say that Beyond that, it leads into, because there is a very thin line which divides reverberation and echo. A reverberation provides us a depth of field, whereas an echo creates a noise. So RT60 is an ideal thing that is calculated. And what we are looking at for an auditorium, since it's a multipurpose, it's not a specific uh, place of uh, one particular at attribute. We are looking in at an RT time of anything between 1.1 to 1.5 seconds that is how we do it 
okay yeah. thank you sir uh, sir one question is also there uh, generally we are having fund projector rooms uh, can you please highlight on the rear projector rooms uh, i mean the question can be can have two different answers and as well as the question can have two different meanings normally in our parlance in a video parlance when we talk of front projection and a rear projection we are looking at a projection which is falling from the audience area or from the stage itself which is hitting the uh, projection screen incident to it from the front side whereas the rear projection comes from behind it the projector is placed the screen material changes and accordingly we get a rear projection screen the challenge in that uh, rear projection is that uh, since the distance between the projector and the screen is too small we have to use an ultra short throw lenses and ultra short throw projectors or we need to have a larger dead area a dead room that houses a projector so that the only the screen lights up on that area whereas a front projection we can have multiple options and uh, with the uh, passage of time the projection technology as i have talked about is changing by the weeks by the months we will very soon the led wall prices are going to come down and the moment the led prices comes down all these projector for a large auditorium spaces for example we uh, we did a auditorium where a projector could cost as good as 40 lakh rupees a large size auditorium projector so a 40 lakh rupees vis a vis as of now, 100 uh, lakh rupees, 1 crore rupees to a LED wall. The moment we come down, maybe 60 lakhs rupees for a LED screen size, probably everyone would like to go in for it. Gyan Bhavan has gone in for LED screens in Delhi. So LED video wall is there in uh, Gyan Bhavan now for all the presentations that are happening. So the projection technology will be limited to school theaters, schools, the home theaters, and likes. Whereas the professional spaces will soon have the jump from uh, LED video wall. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, sir, one more question. Actually, there are so many questions. Uh, what we will do, we will uh, mail you so that we can yes, get Yes, I'll, I'll like to reply them uh, individually one also. I uh, like to ask you one last question. Can you please uh, throw light on the design of orchestra bit? Yes. This is this is what one thing which I never covered, but uh, good. Uh, an orchestra pit auditorium really comes in from uh, Maharashtra. We have been doing projects pan India, and orchestra pit is a phenomena which is very close to Maharashtra. And all auditoriums in Maharashtra and even in Gujarat to a large extent have orchestra pit concept into it. The purpose of having an orchestra pit is uh, one: the a musician sits inside an orchestra pit. And he plays his own music and he is not visible. So whenever a background music or a live music during a theater performance is required, that is done. Then uh, most of the time, the live music is being intermingled with this. Apart from this, an orchestra pit also uses uh, is being used to have a redundant control room because then the audience and the, uh, the artist and the controller is sitting next to each other almost. So he just has to do a simple action, lower down the bass or increase this thing. So the he understands it closely. Otherwise, if he's sitting on the stage and there is a projection room at the back of the hall, so he has to say, thoda bass badaiye, thoda reverb kam kariye. All these things happens during a performance. And the advantage of an orchestra pit being used as a redundant control room is there. So there are two purposes of orchestra pit which are which is being used. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now, towards the end of the session, on behalf of Department of Architecture, MIT Aurangabad, we are very much grateful to engineer Anuj Darbari, sir, for sharing his valuable knowledge with us today. I also extend my gratitude to our management and principal, sir, for all his enthusiastic support and encouragement. Also to our HOD, ma'am, for arranging such a wonderful session for all the students. We are very special, a very special thank to our organizing committee and all supporting faculty members. And last but not the least, a very heartfelt thanks 
to our students and the attendees of today's session on YouTube. Thank you all. I would like to end this session and do join us for our next session, next session in coming future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Should I disconnect now? Just a minute.